Um, the following interview was conducted with Timothy McGinley, Chairman of the Board of Trustees for Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, February the 8th, 2008, and Stewart Center on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and siblings and high school. Well, I was born and raised in Indianapolis, uh, an only child on the uh, grew up, my father uh, worked for the railroads uh, of Irish descent. My mother was of uh, German descent, and uh, uh, they married somewhat late in life, and I was an only child. Uh, went to... Uh, were they both from, Indi are they from Indiana? Or uh, both born? from Indianapolis. Uh -huh. uh, they were both born in Indianapolis and, uh, and raised there. And then, um, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, uh, Catholic... Uh, grade school and high school on the east side of Indianapolis, a school called Cecina Memorial High School, still active, and uh, got uh, involved there in uh, basketball, and, uh, uh, and that really became my path to Purdue, uh, because I was fortunate enough to uh, get a basketball scholarship, and, uh, and I also was a, a good student in, in, in chemistry and math, and so that convinced me I should take engineering. So uh, Purdue was a good marriage of my basketball interests and, and uh, uh, my studies, and ended up coming here to study chemical engineering. Very good. How, what year did you enter, and when did you, and what was the campus like? And uh, did you well, live on campus? Tell us a little bit about your experience. Sure. Uh, it's 1958, the uh, fall, uh, is when I enrolled here. I believe the student body is something like 18,000 then, if I recall correctly. And uh, uh, I remember the freshman year is a, a difficult one for me. Uh, where, were you, where did you live in, Cary? Uh, well, it was what we called H2. Uh, it was, uh, those were the three H halls at the time. They didn't have names uh, yet. I've heard that name. Uh, in before. fact, it was brand new, I believe. And so we, uh, uh, we moved in there, and uh, I roomed with a... Uh, another basketball player named Terry Dishinger, who uh, was quite a good player. And in fact, he made All-American and was on the U.S. Olympic team. But So uh, the first year I spent really uh, with him uh, uh, as a roommate. Um, back then, freshmen couldn't play varsity basketball, just had a freshman team. And uh, so I participated in that, uh, uh, started down the path in chemical engineering, and uh, ended up pledging Phi Gamma Delta as a fraternity, uh, but probably the most indelible memory of the freshman year for me was uh, what a radical change in life and lifestyle. And uh, you know, first time I'd left home and uh, uh, all these uh, new responsibilities, new freedoms, huge school. Uh, it was troublesome for me, uh, particularly during the first semester. And mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, Going home uh, and telling my parents at Christmas time that I wasn't sure I wanted to come back. Uh, so I was kind of lonely and a little down, but uh, got through that period, came back, and uh, and, and things started to go well. All right. Did um, you were, then you started playing on basketball all four years that you were here? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, played all four years. Um, Who was the coach? Uh, uh, Ray Eddy oh. was the coach, uh, and uh, we had a pretty successful basketball team. Uh, uh, I uh, was a starting guard uh, for two and a half years, and uh, uh, we uh, we were competitive in the Big Ten for the championship, but never won it. Ohio State had uh, some very good ball players named Jerry Lucas and John Havlicek. They won the national championship. We could beat everybody, but we couldn't beat them. So. Even IU uh, wasn't so good at that days, or well. Uh, IU was uh, was uh, indeed favored when we were sophomores uh, to win the Big Ten. And one of my greatest memories of uh, the basketball playing days is we went down there and played them in the opening game of the Big Ten season that year as sophomores. Uh, and we upset them uh, down there, and so uh, uh, what a great of all the games I played in, that would be one of the highlights, and it would be for all of my teammates because they were expected to win the Big Ten, and we upset them. Um, they ended up uh, not winning it because Ohio State turned out to be so sure. good. 
What was it after season? It's different. Is it the same as it is now? I mean, if you you made the championship, would it be the NCAA or no? It, it, was, it was uh, unfortunately different because today, as you know, uh, five or six Big Ten teams are likely to be in the NCAA and maybe one or two in the sure. NIT. Uh, back then, the Big Ten prohibited anybody going to a postseason tournament except the champion. So Ohio State, in our case, would go on to the uh, uh, NCAA. Uh, no one else would go there, and nobody could go to the NIT or any other tournament. So our season ended. Uh, if you were at the last top, game. that was it, huh? Yes, and we were uh, we were nationally ranked. Uh, at, at, some, at one point in time, we were in the top ten in the country, but we never. Uh, Never could get into postseason play. And then the, the rule must have changed over time. Is that yes, correct? obviously it, it did. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly when. I, mean, I don't remember, but uh, uh, but it's uh, a lot of the rules have changed. You know, we didn't have uh, three point shots. Uh, <laughs> uh, freshmen couldn't play. Uh, so, uh, and we didn't play nearly as many games. I think uh, we played maybe a total of 23, 24, whereas today. 30 would be. Uh, right. And you played it, what, it was Lambert, is that where you played? Yeah, we played in the old field house, Lambert Field House, uh, which uh, had uh, temporary bleachers that they put up on either side. I've heard about that. I yeah. think it held about 10,000 when they, <laughs> they do that. And every game was on TV, Channel 4, and was sponsored by Chesty Potato Chips. I remember <laughs> that. So it, but it was. Uh, uh, for me, a great memory of Purdue. Uh, just uh, a good start to the rest of your career. It, 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 it basketball. Uh, I mean, I've gone on and done a lot of different things, but uh, I really have to say basketball was the catalyst for me because uh, you know I came to Purdue on a full scholarship. Uh, I couldn't have afforded it uh, otherwise, and uh, you know uh, it was a successful venture for me. I got to play, got some recognition, met a lot of people, made friends, and. Even to this day, some 45 years later, uh, people still sure. come up and want to talk about basketball. It's helped my business career. It helped me get into grad school. So uh, basketball is a, it was is a good a launcher. It was a good for me. Uh, one of the people, once something I read that uh, President Humphrey used to come over and see, watch you practice. That's and true. That he was a, a great fan of athletics. Uh, and he, he had been a student athlete in his day. I understand. He played sport. football uh, at Minnesota and, of course, was a Rhodes Scholar. And so he had combined academics and athletics. And I think he had a fondness uh, for uh, young people who did the same thing. And we were somewhat unique uh, or in that uh, I was studying chemical engineering. Uh, very few athletes would be in that program. and. Uh, uh, actually got to know uh, President Hovde uh, through basketball and uh, uh, actually uh, got to know his uh, uh, daughter who married one of my best friends and uh, we've had a lifelong relationship with the Hovdes and Hovde family and he was uh, kind enough to uh, write letters of recommendation for me to grad school and to another program I uh, entered called the White House Fellows Program. Uh, great fond memories of Fred Hovde and today I, I get a warm feeling at graduations because we uh, were in Hovde Hall right. and we walked down those steps from the uh, president's office and there's this life-size picture of Fred Hovde yeah. looking at me and I just always smile when I see that. <laughs> Tip the hat, right? <laughs> right. Right. What was Chauncey Village like during when you were here as a student? Uh, you know, it, it really wasn't a, a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, where well, there still were some stores, or, but it was, it was smaller? Than yeah, it I, I, I think so. Uh, it wasn't uh, that well developed, or at least in, in my case, uh, between uh, studying chemical engineering, uh, playing basketball, uh, you had a full some split. fraternity life, and then I started chasing a young lady uh, my junior year. Uh, I didn't really spend much time at Chauncey <laughs> Village. <laughs> How about the career path after you finished, uh, before you started the company that you have now? What, was, what did you do after you graduated? Uh, I left Purdue and uh, it took me four and a half years to get out. Uh, I couldn't quite fit everything uh, into the four-year program. So yes, and I went to work for Eli Lilly and Company from January until September. And then I went to the Harvard Business School. Uh, and was there for uh, two years uh, and got a, a master's in business administration. 
And then uh, I ended up staying there an extra year as an assistant to the dean. Uh, and from there, the path took me to Washington, D.C. in this program I mentioned before called the White House Fellows Program, which is an extraordinary opportunity. Tell us a little bit about what the nature of that Well, uh, it was started by, uh, under President Johnson's uh, presidency. It was created by a man named John Gardner. Uh, John Gardner had been Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, as the title was in those days, and president of the Carnegie Foundation. And his concept was that uh, uh, in, in the world at that time, or in the country at that time, there weren't enough young people who got exposure to government and at the highest level uh, early in their careers uh, so that they could benefit from that and take it back to whatever their chosen profession was, business, law, academics, or so forth. And so they created this White House Fellows Program, uh, approximately 15, 16 people a year, you so spend it one it, year? It's one year, uh, and you work for a cabinet uh, member as an assistant, uh, doing whatever it is that he and you decide, uh, mostly he, decide on what you should do. And you, uh, it's supplemented by uh, weekly lunches and meetings with other Washington officials visiting people to the Washington, D.C. area. We were probably in the White House 15 to 20 times that year, um, met with the president uh, often. Uh, wonderful high-level government experience, uh, and then we met so many people uh, that have become lifelong friends mm -hmm. from that experience, mm -hmm. including the, the group that I was uh, fellows with. There's been a lot of famous people go through that program. In fact, uh, Martin Jiske was a I was White House say, fellow. I thought he also because uh, And for that matter, so was Adam Herbert, the last president of, of Indiana oh, yeah. University. Interesting. And other people like Colin Powell uh, was in the program, and uh, Sam Brownback, who's now you know senator from Texas, and and uh, leaders in business and, sure. and academics and yeah. industry. So it was a wonderful experience. So I spent. Uh, a year there uh, in that program, and then the Secretary of Labor, who was my boss, asked me to stay on, and so I stayed there for another year and a half uh, and worked for him, and then uh, then left in, in uh, actually, uh, the story kind of has a Purdue twist. I came back to Lafayette, Indiana, to work for a company called National Homes. Uh, my good friend from Purdue, and a fraternity brother, uh, Dave Price, who had married Fred Hovde's daughter, uh, uh, attracted me to come back to National Homes uh, where his father was the chairman and his uncle was the president, and so I went to work for them for the next five years. Uh -huh. Were you living in Lafayette at the time? Uh, lived in Lafayette, uh, near uh, where a Central Catholic High School okay. is on Teal Road and Bennett Road, uh, sure. right there at that intersection. Uh, our kids uh, were, uh, uh, we had one child when we came back to Lafayette and two were born here and uh, uh, their uh, early child rearing days uh, were all in Lafayette so that's where, the, this is where the kids were brought up. So, let's now talk a little bit about the Board of Trustees. You first were appointed in June of 89 by, was the governor by? Yes. Along with Wayne Townsend yeah. and you've been the chairman since then so tell us a little bit about some of the responsibilities and things that uh, that ensues as the chairman of the board. Sure. Um, well, it, first of all, I, I just uh, summarize it by uh, saying it was one of the rare privileges uh, I've had in my life and, and a wonderful opportunity to uh, uh, serve Purdue, give back to Purdue uh, because it certainly gave uh, me a lot. Um, when I first came on the board, uh, as you mentioned, Evan Bayh appointed me. Uh, they're three-year terms, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been fortunate enough to be reappointed uh, six times by, uh, uh, I guess, four different governors, uh, Republican and Democrat. So I'm thankful for that. Um, it, it, there are ten members of the Board of Trustees, uh, seven appointed by the governor, one of whom is a student, and three elected by the alumni. Uh, and you really have overall responsibility for the university. Probably your number one job is to uh, hire a president right. and yeah. to work with them to uh, uh, set the course of the university uh, and the policies for the university. Uh, and I've uh, gone through two presidential searches now uh, with the board. 
Um, and then beyond that, uh, really the scope uh, has to do with everything and every aspect of the university. We uh, approve the budget for the university, both the operating budget and the capital budget. All tuition mm -hmm. uh, decisions are made by the board. Uh, the naming of buildings, uh, the approval of all the construction contracts, all this construction you've seen around here for, over the last um, uh, five years or so, almost totaling a billion dollars, would all be projects that the uh, board would uh, review and approve. Uh, the hiring of uh, uh, faculty and, and approval of appointments there. Uh, we really reach uh, athletic decisions. Uh, we really reach uh, into all, all aspects. aspects of the university. Right. And Th these are the things that what I'm thinking of that researchers are going to be using, and that's why I was asking some of those questions. The tuition, of course, that that's a, a challenge. Trying to keep it, you know, at a, at a level, and uh, it's it's diff all of these are difficult and hard decisions yeah. that sometimes people don't realize that that's right. uh, it takes a lot to come to the to a consensus and also a decision. Um, the election of officers, how does that come about? You, for the uh, board. For the board, yes. Sure. The, well, the, uh, I mentioned how you become a trustee, and then the ten trustees elect their own officers. Okay. So okay. Uh, I've been, uh, uh, I was elected a, a chairman, and then it's a two-year term for the chairman, and then you can stay in for re-election. Sure. And uh, uh, actually, I'm in my 16th year as chairman, so I've been at this uh, Right. quite some time and have seen a lot of an events unfold. Yeah. Question, um, on the appointment, you're appointed by the governor. I'm thinking of a researcher might, how does that come, how does the appointment come about? Do they contact you or? Um, well, I, I don't know that there is a defined process. I think each they, governor. they approach you in some fashion. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can be approached, although a lot of people will uh, find a way to express their interest sure. uh, in in It works from that standpoint, right. And uh, I, I'm sure there's no shortage of people who would love to serve in this capacity. It's a wonderful opportunity. And so, uh, you know, the governor has to decide from um, among those that either he knows uh, or uh, those who express interest or whether uh, uh, who he's going to pick. There have been some issues, I guess, along the way. Uh, Purdue had, in the past have, have had spots reserved for people with certain backgrounds, like the ag community, agriculture community had to be represented. Uh, at one time, uh, essentially the manufacturing industries had to be uh, represented. I mentioned a student uh, has to be on the, uh, the board. Uh, so there are those considerations, and and then for a long time the law was you had to be a resident of Indiana. Ask, that has changed now. And that has changed, yeah. and right now we have uh, several trustees uh, who live out of state, uh, and that change has come about while I've been on the board, and it, it's, uh, I think, reflected the university as we've grown uh, more national in perspective, right. even global in perspective, uh, and we have alums all over the world. Uh, it makes sense that some recognition be given to uh, uh, that stamp for Purdue, but at the same time we are also beholden to the people of Indiana right. who are ultimately our, our bosses uh, because they pay the taxes that uh, pay the bill and the legislature and that's governor uh, have ultimate uh, responsibility for us and that's given to the trustees from them. Right. And there's a, um, you also the elect directors of the foundation boards, PRF, do you, are you involved in the election for people on those boards too? Uh, there the are trustees uh, trustee that? spots okay. on the Purdue Research Foundation board and the uh, uh, trustees select uh, one of their own to serve in those. Uh, there are other Purdue Research Foundation board members in addition and those have a different uh, pattern of selection. Okay, and you spoke earlier about your faculty promotions and the deans and the and emeritus, but some of these are delegated as far as to the president has certain things that you work in conjunction that, with. That's that correct, right? okay. yeah, yeah. We'll delegate a lot to the president and essentially work through the president uh, to implement everything right. uh, uh, that we want to do. Right now, one of the key questions is, is developing a strategic plan for the university. This is to uh, be phase two. We just went through a, a six, seven year plan with uh, President Jiski. That culminated last June 30. 
We have a new president, and we're in the process of developing a new plan, engaging, hopefully, the whole university in right. that process. And uh, sometime later this spring, the board will endorse a, a final plan, and sure. that will be the blueprint for the for next that, for, five or six right, years. Yeah. A couple of, uh, the board has some committees. You might want to uh, if you make a comment. We have finance and physical. Uh, so they have, these are standing committees, is that the way? That's it, true. Okay. And those committees are, are uh, called for in our bylaws. I see. Uh, and identified uh, as such and have the type of responsibilities the name may imply. Finance committee worries about the budget, uh, worries about uh, uh, any, any aspect of, uh, of finance. Uh, the uh, physical facilities committee uh, we have uh, a massive inventory of buildings around here that we have to maintain and repair. Uh, we're always in the process of adding new buildings, and, and they are concerned about uh, you know the hiring of contractors, hiring of architects, approving contracts, etc. Uh, so that comes under their their preview. We have an academic affairs committee, which is basically uh, all faculty issues and all student issues. Uh, come into that committee and, and, uh, and, and the schools themselves will have reports uh, in that committee on, say, the engineering school or, or the veterinary school. Uh, there's an audit and insurance committee, which is precisely what it mm -hmm. does. It worries about the uh, auditing of uh, the university and insurance programs. And then we have an executive committee, which uh, also uh, uh, functions uh, primarily to handle uh, urgent matters that come up in between the regular board meetings. Right. Uh, and, you know, we're currently in the process of uh, reviewing the board itself and it's saying, well, do we have the right committees? And, and uh, what we want to do is strategically align the committees with whatever the strategic plan for the university is so, so that we're in sync. Right, yeah. yeah. What about the regional campuses? Uh, you have contacts with, and they have representatives that attend the meetings. Is that uh, uh, the tie-in with the regional campuses and sure. the board? Sure, sure. Well, uh, several uh, things uh, should be said about that. First of all, uh, while they're regional campuses, we view it as one Purdue, right. and that includes the regional campuses. So one of the things we do is, loc is uh, rotate our, the site of our board meetings and we will visit uh, in rotation every regional campus and we'll include in that uh, the campus in Indianapolis which is run by the IU Board of Trustees but nevertheless Purdue has a significant right. presence. So we rotate the location so we can go and see and talk to the people and hear reports uh, directly at the campus uh, so we can be better informed on their issues. Then in addition to that, uh, representatives are always in attendance at our board meetings in, in West Lafayette. Uh, and for example, we had a board meeting this morning and we'll always hear a report from one of the chancellors, one of the faculty representatives, yeah, and one of the, the student campuses. representatives. Mm -hmm. Well, what we do is, is uh, the cha if, if, if it's the chancellor of one, then it will be the faculty representative of another and the student representative of the third and then we rotate that around so Sounds that we're good. hearing them all over time. So sure. we keep uh, closely connected to the uh, regional campuses and of course all the chancellors report to the president. The president reports to the board so that in our meetings with the president frequently there's regional campus issues on the sure. agenda. Okay, and we, um, <coughs> the naming of the buildings, uh, that's sort of an, if you make a comment on that, because people say, how does that come about and uh, do I have to be here for a certain period of time or just uh, how it sure. just comes about, like Hillenbrand for an example. Uh, yeah, Hillenbrand Hall, when that was named uh, uh, Residence Hall uh, some years ago, uh, um, was in recognition of uh, Hillenbrand members on the Board of Trustees. Uh, I can't remember the length of service that the first Hillenbrand served, but I, he is, was the longest serving trustee ever and then was succeeded by his son who served two additional terms. So there was that service to the university and then the company has been associated uh, with the university in supporting a variety of programs over time. So 
so Hillenbrand Hall uh, was named for them. There's uh, uh, probably two main categories that, that, that would come to mind. Certainly distinguished service to the university uh, would perhaps raise your name up for consideration. Uh, Hovde Hall, for example, we've right. talked about Fred Hovde, and of course Steve Bering had a uh, right. building uh, named after him. Martin Jiske just retired in June, and a building was named after him. And then there are other uh, naming situations which aren't necessarily the entire building, but for example, uh, last night we uh, ate in the Ro uh, Robert Ringel Art Gallery uh, in the Union Building, named after a distinguished provost here. Um, and then there are others uh, where uh, there is a need to build the building, uh, and we have to go out and raise monies privately to do that. And uh, sometimes we will recognize the donor, the primary donor uh, in that building. The, the Michael Burke Nanotechnology uh, Center would be an example of that. Or there's a building named after Bill Binley out in Discovery right, Park. And yes. There's a series of those. Those are probably the two main drivers, but uh, occasionally there'll be uh, something that's a little bit of an outlier to that that might come along. Yeah. It's and, interesting. And deserve no, naming. It's a challenge, anyway. Right. Yeah. Now, the presidential search committee. You addressed that before. That's, mm -hmm. as you said, the hiring of the is the most important duty. And you were the uh, you chaired the one for the successor for Steve right. Herring, and then you served on the most recent one. Uh, any comments that you'd care to make on uh, the researchers? Yeah, yeah. Just a slight correction. I wasn't on the last one, oh. uh, but I was on the board. Uh, eventually, the board of trustees makes the decision. But in, in both of uh, these last two searches, a search committee was established. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I did chair the one that brought Martin Jiske to Purdue. Uh, and that committee consisted of trustees, faculty members, uh, student, uh, alumni representative, uh, uh, and several uh, chancellors. Uh, so we tried to make sure it was a cross-section of the university. And their job is to, first of all, generate applic uh, applications, generate through a variety of means, uh, names that should be considered. Uh, for example, they would uh, perhaps write a letter to all the faculty and say, if you have suggestions from your field of interest, please forward them. And, uh, and it becomes, becomes known uh, that there's an opening. They hire a search firm to help in this. I was going to say, uh, the, you do have gone with a search firm. Yeah, both both uh, searches involved a search firm. Okay. And uh, they're very helpful at generating names. And just to give you a flavor for it, in the, in the search that brought Martin Jiske here, we probably had 125 names initially for the committee. And then they would set up a process of, of starting to wean that down. And that would, uh, you can probably eliminate half of them pretty easily. But it gets a little harder when you get down to the, you know, the rest of them. Uh, and they'll do as much as they can uh, based on the papers that are presented to them, resumes and recommendations and others, and eventually get down to um, about 20 or 25, and then it even gets harder. Uh, and they'll move that process down to uh, interviews with uh, candidates. And then, uh, then they'll take that, their work and their results and recommend a small number uh, for so further this is consideration. A that's doing a lot of the calling, the screening. Yes, okay. exactly. Right. And and then they'll get it down to maybe uh, four or five, and then they'll turn that work over to the trustees. And the trustees, the ten of them, will take that further and uh, uh, do additional screening, checking, interviewing and uh, finally uh, make a decision on that's who right. the next president should yeah. be. But confidentiality is the key thing there. Confidentiality, in my view, is absolutely essential. Right. And, and the reason is, is simple. The best candidates will not let their name be considered if it's going to be made public. And that would compromise their current positions. Right. If an existing president at another university would somehow make it known he's interested or she's interested, that would become public. They would have difficulties back home. Right. And uh, so to maximize the quality of, of the candidates, I think you have to keep it confidential. Right. And we did uh, both of these searches. Right. 
uh, strategic plan, the forum that just closed, a couple of comments on that. I know you addressed there's a new one coming up, but right. it was it's very effective. When we uh, hired Martin Jeske, uh, well, let me make a, uh, another uh, remark to lead okay. into that. Okay. Uh, before we started either pr any presidential search, uh, we always did a, a rather thorough analysis of the university, the trustees did. Uh, including a lot of involvement with faculty, with deans and others, to come up with uh, what we thought were the strategic imperatives going forward for the university. And from that would lead to what should the criteria be uh, for the next president. Namely, they, did they have the skills proven that matched what you wanted to do. Uh, so we would, we would go through that uh, analysis. And one of the strategic uh, but one of the things that surfaced in the uh, Jiski preparation uh, was the need to have a strategic plan. So we wanted someone who had demonstrated that they could, could create one and implement one. And, and that was one of the criteria we had before we even uh, knew the name of Martin Jiski. Uh, so when we ended up hiring him, it was with the mandate that you should create a strategic plan and let's work with it. And, and uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, that was one of his first items uh, yeah. to accomplish. Uh, the plan was created. It took about a year and then, uh, you know, five or six years in implementing it uh, and being accountable for improvement and measurements along the way. And I think uh, the results are obvious around here. The, uh, the uh, second one we had, which ties in, was to start a major capital drive. And, That's uh, what's going to address the capital campaign. Yeah, and, campaign and we can talk about that, but uh, it sort of folded in and made the strategic plan happen. You know, it allowed us to create the buildings and hire the 300 net new faculty sure. and increase student scholarships and so forth. So yeah, we're, we're very much as a board uh, committed to the process of strategic planning. Right. And then the campaign for Purdue is always going to, is a flowing, I was going to ask you yeah. a couple of comments on that. Well, you know, uh, it's it, it, just an overwhelming right? success. Uh, and again, that was a criteria we had in hiring a new president, someone who enjoyed and was good at and had demonstrated results in, in private fundraising. And uh, Martin Jiski fit that bill. Sure. Uh, before we hired him, and uh, he succeeded beyond all our expectations. Uh, to give you some uh, semblance of the magnitude of it, the last campaign prior to the one we had... Was that the Vision 21? Uh, Vision 21, yeah, I think Vision it was 20. called, yeah. raised about $330 million. Uh, this campaign raised a billion seven. So that's roughly five or six uh, fold increase in revenues and support for the university. Uh, and it's shown in every area. Um, we have uh, found new alumni uh, who uh, hadn't supported the university before that stepped up. Current contributors at a certain level increased their amount. Uh, the enthusiasm, and I, but I do think, uh, just to tie the two together, that one of the reasons the fundraising campaign was so successful is because we had the strategic plan and you could go to a pr prospective donor and say, here's what we want to do, here's what we're trying to accomplish, here's the roadmap, please help us. Um, and that, I think, uh, sold and uh, they responded. Yeah, right. And give, of course, giving back the, um, and you have certainly done that and, and the uh, well, that business opportunity program and giving back and ass yeah. assisting with that. And one of the items I read said, education is the one sure investment we can make for our future. And that certainly is uh, shown in that particular program, among other things. Yeah, too. yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that. And I, sure. I really think uh, all the employees and faculty and everybody who works at Purdue uh, believes in it. I mean, what better way to spend your life than uh, giving uh, other people uh, the means to improve their own lives, improve their family lives, and improve the world, literally. And that's what education does. And right. so uh, in our case, uh, we contributed, it's, it's called the Purdue Opportunities Award, mm -hmm. which provides scholarships for uh, people who have had a financial need for sure, 
but also overcome another handicap and some marvelous uh, cases in there. Uh, one child, for example, both parents are in prison. Uh, another child was homeless. Uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're at Purdue, and they're succeeding at Purdue. They're bright, talented kids. They're just their circumstances. They just need a little difficult. bit of a lift up to, to exactly. get to that and, level. And uh, you know, we all do that right. uh, in our own way to to help uh, these young people progress and get the talents and opportunities that we've had. And uh, it, it's a great feeling to be able. Uh, someone once told me it says, "Don't give until it hurts." Give until it feels good. <laughs> and good. This feels good. <laughs> right. Let's talk about a couple of your. Uh, now you're on the steering committee for the Mackey Arena up yes. there, aren't you? And that's uh, a new thing that's coming up. That along. is. We Coming finished the uh, uh, the capital campaign, right? The billion seven, and we're sort of in an interim period here. And so what has happened is that we've uh, uh, targeted some specific projects rather than an overall university campaign specific projects that need addressing now and help now. And the Mackey project is one of those. Uh, student access is another one and that uh, will uh, get more wind behind it here later uh, in a couple of months. Uh, but that'll be an important part uh, as well of our fundraising capacity. But uh, I am involved in the Mackey project. Uh, as you had mentioned earlier, I played basketball so I have a fondness for athletics and a fondness for basketball. And uh, there's a need there to uh, raise about $30 million uh, in private support to supplement other revenue streams to bring us to probably an $80 million renovation of Mackey in addition to Mackey to uh, add things like sports medicine facilities, uh, academic training facilities and stuff that will benefit all athletes, not just basketball players. Um, so my wife and I are happy to to support that and looking forward to it being successful. They've already uh, got about 20 some million dollars right. committed to that program. Right. So I'm, uh, I think it'll, it'll be a success. I have a comment. The sketches I've seen in the news, it's going to really change Northwestern. It's going to be spread going further. Is that, uh, they're going to build off from that? Or yeah, it, it, uh, as you go north on Northwestern, which now is parking, uh, parking, parking lot, exactly. Th that will actually be an addendum to Mackey Arena, and that's where these new facilities will be. There, there, Mackey Arena itself will essentially remain the same. It should uh, retain the, the, the energy and history and tradition <laughs> and <laughs> loudness and everything, <laughs> everything else. Everything that goes with it, we got uh, it. In, that, in that, and people should uh, be able to recognize it's the same facility. But for example, the concourses around it, which are too narrow today, they'll all be widened and uh, there'll be a, additional things uh, at levels below that and above that. And then this expansion, as you mentioned, will up northwestern. Will it change, northwest the, change the parking that uh, is there? Yes, th okay. there will be uh, changes in the parking. Okay. And, uh, but ho ho hopefully, uh, uh, if that's that's being addressed. There'll be plenty of opportunity. Hopefully, we'll have parking problems because so many people will want to come. Everybody to the game. has a problem. Parking. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, a couple th about. Have you participated in the alumni? You're being a Purdue grad. Do you uh, any participation in alumni activities? Uh, well, uh, Indianapolis or. Yeah, I, I, we. My wife also went to Purdue, so we've been active uh, alums really from the time we moved back to Indiana. Uh, and in fact, I, I got my first connection back to the university in a more formal way. The Purdue Engineering alumni started an association. And, uh, and I was, uh, I don't know whether I was the first president of that or the second, but an early president in that organization. So that was sort of my first formal reconnect with the university when uh, uh, when I came back here and uh, uh, we've been, you know, we're life members of the uh, Alumni Association. Uh, I've spoken to several uh, of the Alumni Associations and, and traveled uh, with them. Uh, you know, it's a, an essential active arm of the university and the, the benefits from membership and the members, uh, and benefits of participation are, are, are just worth doing. Right. So. It's certainly addressing your basketball. You got inducted in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame along with Larry Bird. 
Well, yeah, that's true. And I love Which to say, well, <laughs> I, I got in the same class as Larry Bird, but I, I do have, in all fairness, to mention it was uh, his first year of eligibility and my 16th year of eligibility. <laughs> so that probably but describes the together. gap in talent. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then you also got the President's Council Distinguished Service Award, and that was the Council's 30th anniversary. That's very yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, uh, your wife that you met here. Sure. And, uh, and you have children. Did they, your children go to Purdue? Uh, the, the children did not. But to, to uh, uh, I met her uh, as a junior here at Purdue, and uh, we started she dating. What? She was uh, she's a school teacher, uh, and she was majoring in elementary ed. Sure. And uh, she was she grew up in Lafayette. And, oh, is she born and raised here? Uh, born and raised here, and in fact, uh, just to give you the tie that how I met her. The, the, Fred Hubdy's daughter, who married Dave Price, a good friend, uh, Dave Price and she were high school classmates, and he said, you got to meet this friend of mine, classmate. And so anyway, that happened, and uh, we started dating, and like a lot of people, you know, we had an off and on relationship for uh, some period of time. She'll say too long. I think it took uh, four and a half years before we finally got <laughs> married, uh, but uh, we got married the... Uh, uh, in between the two years in grad school at, at Harvard, um, uh, had three children, uh, a boy and two girls, and now they're all grown and gone. Uh, our youngest at 35 got married this past fall, uh, but uh, all three kids, uh, you mentioned their education, all three of them have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Uh, so they have six degrees, but I have to admit I've failed as a Purdue salesman because none of those degrees are from <laughs> Purdue. <laughs> That's all right. Do <laughs> uh, the, um, you have a uh, favorite memory of Purdue? Oh, there, there, there's so many. Uh, you know, the highlight would be uh, the courtship and, and marriage uh, eventually uh, to Jane. And, and by the way, we're still married, so uh, sure. it's been a long a successful marriage and uh, you know the, all the events surrounding that uh, are wonderful memory uh, the basketball uh, days and, and the successes and, and even the failures there uh, uh, are great wonderful memories uh, the whole fraternity life and uh, uh, good friends that were made there and even beyond the fraternity the friendships uh, you know that came out of uh, Purdue um, those Purdue days uh, be another me memory, and and of course the outstanding education that you get here. I mean, uh, Purdue has been for me the uh, the catalyst, like it is for thousands of kids every year. But uh, uh, you know, my neither of my parents went to college. Uh, I grew up in a somewhat limited uh, background. We weren't poor, but. Uh, you know, we didn't have exposure to much, and Purdue opened all these doors, and uh, um, so, uh, you know, the memories are, are wonderful and sound, and that's in part why I do what I do for the last uh, so many years uh, at staying involved and get it, giving back time and energy and even some money. And it's too. opened up a lot of avenues for you and opportunities, yes. and you've been able to take yeah. Take them and, uh, run it, with it, them. You know, that's happened to me, but I, I, I think the important point is it happens to thousands and thousands of kids year in and year after. And I see that we go out and talk to potential donors for the university. And you say, well, why, why are you giving this money back? And it's because this is where it happened for them. This is what made all the difference uh, in their careers and their lives. And, and, uh, and they don't forget, and they want to, you know, remember and right. support, continue yep. their support. They want to, and they want to make sure that opportunity exists for somebody else, and uh, right. that's such a wonderful thing to be a part of. Yes. Any in closing comments that you'd like to share with us? Well, uh, as you look back on it, and uh, perhaps sometime after, we might like to do a follow-up sometime after sure. uh, we're off the board and. Uh, Which would be really I'd be, nice. That, I'd be glad to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, to summarize uh, Purdue uh, for me, uh, it has been such an integral part of my life. I mean, I came here at, at 18, and uh, you know, I'm still involved at 67. So it's been a lifelong situation. Right. I, uh, I met my wife here. I, I 
got my education here, the basketball things we've talked about. And then, you know, even in more the last 15 years, this board service, uh, I can't tell you how many uh, new friends that I've met, strong friendships that that exist that extend well beyond uh, Purdue. And, and the uh, opportunities I've had uh, to participate in making Purdue a, a little bit better than it was when you came and knowing that the impact it has on uh, kids and, and staff, faculty and alumni and the place we have in the world of education both in this country and beyond uh, and to think that you've uh, had the privilege of just spending a little bit of time uh, and a little bit of your efforts, and they may have made a difference somewhere, that's a great reward. Yeah, that's very nice. Uh, I'm closing on that. That's very nice. And I thank, thank you, you very much for this interview. Thank this you. You're thank welcome. You. Good luck with your project.